The story of this cold-blooded killer begins over 35 years ago in the picturesque city of St Albans in Hertfordshire. Joanne Dennehy was born in 1982 and began life in a loving and secure family home. Very few could have predicted this bright and intelligent young girl would turn into a sadistic monster with a taste for violence. By all accounts, she was starting off in life with a what we might say is a perfect foundational upbringing. Joanne Dennehy appears to come from quite a normal family. She had a relatively uneventful childhood. She's one of, of two siblings. Um, her, her mother worked in a supermarket. Her father worked as a security guard and for a, a telecommunications company. And from the outside, they appear to be a, a normal family. She had a sister to which she was very close. Uh, they had even developed a secret language. Uh, she, was, uh, she played netball for the school. Um, she was a very <laughs> normal, quite bright schoolgirl. But Dennehy's idyllic childhood was curtailed as she entered her teens. She started to experiment with drugs, she started not going to school, and she linked up with a man called John Trina. Her parents, they were at their wits' end. They didn't know what to do. Uh, they tried to keep her locked up or bring her home from school. The teachers tried to reprimand her. And the more they tried to control Joe, it was Joe saying, stuff you. And it, it was li literally like throwing petrol on a fire. Dennehy and Trina ran away together, embarking on a turbulent relationship. Despite Dennehy's violent outbursts, the couple had two children together and eventually settled in Cambridgeshire. I think quite a lot is made of the fact that Joanne Dennehy misused alcohol and, and drugs, but, but I think she's well aware of the fact that this is going to be discussed, and she knows that these offer quite a convenient excuse for her behaviour. And alcohol and drugs and other substances can disinhibit, but that's assuming that people have got those moral standards to begin with, and Joanne Dennehy didn't have them in the first place. A very disturbed woman, she had done a lot of self-harm, of cutting herself and so on. So there were a number of danger signs that this was somebody who was not attuned to society. As time went on, Dennehy's erratic behaviour intensified. She'd cheat on Trina and leave him and their two children for sporadic periods of time. Her drinking worsened and she reportedly began to carry a knife hidden in her boot. I think she's, she's somebody who perhaps has always enjoyed hurting other people. It's almost like she's this crazy scientist and the world is her experiment. Finally, in 2009, Trinor took the children and fled from Dennehy, afraid of what she might do next. The company that she was keeping as well, she was surrounded by people who were similarly disconnected. So, so I think when there was no check or filter or break on her behaviour, she was only going to get worse. Dennehy had become no stranger to the local police. She'd been in and out of prison for drug offences and was also given a 12-month community order for being in control of a dangerous dog. In February 2012, Dennehy spent three days on the psychiatric unit at Peterborough City Hospital, where she was diagnosed with a series of disorders. She has had various diagnoses attached to her, antisocial personality disorder, psychopathic personality disorder. And these are our conditions, they're not mental illnesses. And there's a real important difference between the two because people with personality disorders know the difference between right and wrong. They're, they're fully rational, they're in control of what they're doing, but they choose to do it anyway. So she's not somebody who feels bad, who feels remorseful, who regrets things. She does what she wants to do, and she doesn't care about the consequences. By 2013, 31-year-old Dennehy had settled in a small bedsit in Byfield, a housing estate in Peterborough. But the local residents were unaware of her troubled past or her violent nature. One of Dennehy's new neighbours was Michelle Bowles. She was polite to me. Like, but I wouldn't melt, melt on her mouth, basically. She was well-spoken to me and never swore. She was actually quite pleasant, do you know what I mean? I showed her respect. She loved babies. She was excellent with children. Um, I didn't have a problem with her. When I saw her or spoke to her, I said hello. She said hello back. But other residents were not so sure. 
Michelle's friend John Chapman lived in the same building as Dennehy. He was a Falklands War veteran who'd fallen on hard times. I don't know what regiment he used to be in. I should know, because the amount of stories he used to say. It's just John being smiley all the time and happy and like, nice to know. But John Chapman didn't smile when Joanne Dennehy was around. John was petrified. John came in mind and he said, on several occasions, there's this mad woman moved in. She says she's going to get rid of me whatever way she can. And he was right to be afraid. In just a few months, Joanne Dennehy's threats would turn to violence and John Chapman would be dead. 31-year-old Lukas Slabozewski had moved to the UK from Poland in 2005. After meeting Dennehy a few days previously, he began exchanging text messages with her. On the 19th of March 2013, Slabozewski went to visit Dennehy at one of the houses she was staying in on Rolleston Garth and was never seen alive again. She almost certainly lured this man with the promise of some kind of sexual favour. But without a moment's hesitation, she stabbed him through the chest once, very, very hard, killing him almost instantly. Slabozewski had been coaxed into Dennehy's deadly embrace. She led him to believe the pair were in a relationship. He willingly and naively entered the trap she'd laid for him. Everybody that comes into contact with Joanne Dennehy, it's like falling into a spider's web and you can't get out. Men can't get out. They become entranced by her for all sorts of reasons. Dennehy had complete disregard for the life she'd just taken. Dennehy puts this poor Polish man's body in a wheelie bin and then shows it to a 14-year-old. And so look how, how clever I am. I've killed this man in the wheelie bin. But it was only a temporary solution. Dennehy knew she couldn't keep Slabozewski's body in a bin. She had to dispose of it quickly, but she needed help. She called upon one of her friends, 47-year-old Gary Stretch, who was more than willing to assist. Joanne Dennehy is quite bright. She's quite clever. So she's able to exert quite a lot of control in her interactions with, with other people. And that's what makes her exceptionally dangerous. Now, looking at the relationship that Joanne Dennehy had with her accomplices, I think she was able to, to charm these men. She was able to kind of lure them in, really, and they would have been flattered by her attentions. You know, here she is, this younger woman wanting to spend time with them. These were men who had quite dull, quite boring lives, and I think they were quite excited to, to get involved in, in what Joanne wanted to do. At seven foot two inches tall, Gary Stretch towered above Dennehy's slight frame. An unsuccessful burglar, Stretch was absolutely infatuated by her twisted and lethal charms. Gary Stretch and Joe and Dennehy met uh, when both of them were on parole from prison for various offences. She realised that she could use him to do whatever she wanted. Um, he was her bodyguard, her minder. Um, and that's how they formed this team, which became so overpowering for Stretch that he would do anything for her. I don't think Joanne Dunne had any emotional feelings towards her accomplices whatsoever. They were useful to her at the time, and, and she just cast them aside when she was finished with them. With the help of Stretch, Dennehy dumped Lukas Slabozewski's body in a ditch in rural Thorny Dyke, just 10 miles east of Peterborough city centre. When we look at the, the two attempted murders, you know, towards the end of her, her spree, this is something altogether different. These are strangers. These are men that, that she doesn't know. So I think what was happening here was that she was up in the ante. She was getting bored. You find that psychopaths tend to have a proneness to boredom and a need for stimulation. So, so she was even applying that to her murders. Remarkably, both men survived these attacks. Although their injuries were life-threatening, they were still able to give the police descriptions of Dennehy and the instantly recognisable star tattoo on her cheek. By now, the police sirens are going all round, and blue lights are going all round Hebridgeshire. They're panicking, it's like somebody's kicked over a wasp nest. The local police had been alerted to her spree and were about to put an end to her bloodshed. They cornered Dennehy and Stretch on Newton Close in Hereford. Two officers turn up and they spot this car with Dennehy in it, talking to the dog on the back seat, 
while Gary Stretch is trying to negotiate stolen property at the front door of one of his associates' house. They arrest Dennehy on the spot. Gary Stretch and one of his friends do what they call in police parlance a runner. They jump in another car and speed off. Something like a car chase goes on for about 20 miles. And then Stretch decides to get out and run for it. Now, Mr. Stretch is not built for speed. And of course, he's very unfit and he's stopped. And he turned around to the police officer and said, Ah, you've arrested me. Joe and I would have been the next Bonnie and Clyde. Footage of Dennehy in custody at Hannyford Police Station just 40 minutes after stabbing two men and leaving them for dead showed her laughing and joking with the arresting officers. One mark for attempted murder and murder. Attempted murder and murder, what's that mean? So I'm going down the Sunday roads. Oh, Excuse me. Joanne Dennehy is like a chameleon. Um, she's become a very accomplished actor, so she will play to whatever audience is in front of her. Um, she can be charming and, and sound very educated and, and literate. And at the same time, to another audience, she could sound quite rough and quite downbeat. So she's, she's really honed these, these skills of responding to, to the people that, that are around her. The following day, April the 3rd, 2013, the bodies of Dennehy's other two victims were discovered just outside of Peterborough. In a ditch on farmland at Thorny Dyke, investigators found 31-year-old Luka Slabazewski and 56-year-old John Chapman, a close friend of Michelle Bowles. Michael Ryan was born just 10 miles from Hungerford in Marlborough, Wiltshire, on the 18th of May 1960. His 55-year-old father, Alfred, was 20 years senior to Ryan's mother, Dorothy, who doted on their young son. Michael was a bit of a mummy's boy. Um, she really did pander to him and tended to insulate him quite a lot from the outside world. But I think in insulating him, she tended to isolate him a little bit as well. So he didn't really develop the, the skills of, of social interaction with his peers all that well. Ryan was an only child who struggled to fit in with the other kids at school. I think because he hadn't had those relationships with siblings that, that most children have, um, he found it difficult to relate to other people. So he didn't really make any connections with others at school. And, and I think he, he got a bit of a reputation as being the older one out, the slightly strange kid. Age 16, Ryan left John O'Gaunt's secondary school and began his working career as a part-time handyman. His mother continued to dote on him, even as he grew older reportedly buying him everything he wanted, including his first air rifle. He began a collection of firearms, which he kept on proud display in his room. The Freudians would say that was a significant thing because of his own lack of masculinity and had to use a gun to confirm his own masculinity. He lived in a fantasy world of gun magazines and used to wear a strange kind of camouflage hat, as though he was really Rambo. Some have speculated that he was spoiled, some that he was just overindulged. But there is no doubt that he turned into a tragic loner. In 1985, 25-year-old Ryan lost his father to cancer and became even more withdrawn from the society around him. He immersed himself in his passion for guns, spending more and more time at the firing range. Often when we look at spree killers, we look at what drives them. It's often an underlying simmering resentment that is often years in the making. And because they don't have those social connections with other people, they simmer away and they just get worse and, and worse. And they spend a lot of time on their own, ruminating and planning. On the 19th of August, 1987, the 27-year-old was unemployed and still living at home with his mother. The frustration simmering inside Michael Ryan was about to boil over. No one can say whether he got out of bed that morning and decided, I think I'm going to shoot 16 people today. Though there could be no doubt that he took out two semi-automatic rifles and a Beretta handgun, and by 12.30 had killed his first victim. 
Ryan had loaded his car with guns and driven out to Savanac Forest, seven miles west of Hungerford. 35-year-old Susan Godfrey was picnicking there with her two young children. Ryan approached Susan Godfrey and her two children, instructed her at gunpoint to put her children into the car, then took her into the bushes in the forest and shot her 13 times in the back. Ryan had callously and brutally committed his first murder. Indeed, it was her children who subsequently first raised the alarm when they told a passerby, a man in black has shot our mummy. Ryan continued with his bloody spree on Southview, shooting at passing cars. First, he fired at a mother and her daughter, who managed to escape by driving away. Then he shot and killed driver George White and another neighbour, 84-year-old Abdul Khan, who was in the back garden of his home on Fairview Road. He shoots at a neighbour, he shoots at an ambulance, which has also responded to the concept of shots fired. The man dissembling, disintegrating before your very eyes, falling apart, shooting at people entirely at random. And then, of all remarkable coincidences, his mother drives into the South View. Ryan's mother, Dorothy, arrived to a scene of complete devastation. It's almost impossible to imagine what she must have thought. Her house is on fire, there are bodies in the road, her neighbours are dead, and there's her son carrying two rifles and a handgun, clearly having done something absolutely terrifying. His mother gets out of the car, puts her hands up and pleads with him. Ryan shoots her, kills her. It could be theorised that, that he accidentally shot his mother. I mean, if he was experiencing some kind of psychosis, uh, some kind of mental health condition where he wasn't in control of his actions, he could well have just been targeting people randomly, people who appeared in his line of sight and his mother happened to be one of those people. As this scene of absolute tragedy and terror continued to unfold on Southview, Trevor Wainwright reported for duty at Hungerford Police Station. It was quite bedlam, to be honest. In those days, we only had two phone lines into the police station, and there was a lot of movement. The first thing I wanted to know is who this was that was shooting people, because, you know, I'd been at Hungerford as a bobby 15 years. I knew all the kids. I played football with them. I took them for football, and I had a wonderful relationship with people in the town. And this name, Michael Ryan, came out, and it didn't mean anything to me. I thought, well, who the hell's that? At 1.30 p.m., the specially trained tactical firearms unit were brought in to support the local police. You know, the adrenaline was running through me and I knew what I wanted to do was to accompany the armed police when they arrived because I was the local Bobby, you know, and I thought, well, they didn't know where he was, you know, the location of him at that time. And so I said, well, I'll go down to the news agents and get local maps and Norden survey maps. I drove my car down into the high street and I was amazed to see a row of ambulances, uh, a PC that stopped the traffic and a couple of fire engines, uh, more police cars and there was people sheltering in shop doorways. I just went straight into the news agents. I said, let me have your street maps, let me have your, all the maps you've got. So I was able to get some, grab them, drove back to the police station and by that time there was lots of uh, senior police officers coming in and armed response vehicles that were coming in. We knew something pretty serious was going on but we didn't really know the scale of it. The telephone system was overwhelmed. I think it was very difficult for the police to find out where he was and what he'd done. Even with the help of the maps, the police were struggling to locate Ryan. At that time there was conflicting reports as to his exact location because of the communication problem with the phones. Calls were coming in saying he was in one street, but of course he'd moved on by the time that call had been processed. So nobody knew where he was, but all the time he was shooting people as he went round the streets. Ryan was on the move. After wounding another of his neighbours on Clark's Gardens, he'd headed back across Hungerford Common, where he murdered Francis Butler, a young father who was walking his dog. His tenth victim of the day was taxi driver Marcus Barnard, whom he gunned down on Bullpit Lane. 
But Ryan wasn't nearly finished. He was heading towards the heavily populated town centre. On Priory Avenue, he'd shot and injured two more people before heading north towards Fairview Road. Ryan continued south on Priory Road, now heading away from the town centre and towards his old school, John O'Gaunt. He shot at a family who were driving by in their car. 34-year-old father Ian Playle was hit in the neck and died. In less than 90 minutes, Ryan had killed 16 people. Finally, Ryan, I think symbolically, returns to his old school, the John O'Gaunt Community College, and he locks himself in. By this time, the police have managed to assemble a reaction, and he begins to negotiate. For five hours, the police tried convincing Ryan to give himself up. He seems incredibly concerned about his mother. That seems to be what is at the forefront of his mind, what he's most concerned with. And you could interpret that as some kind of remorse, but actually I think it's more indicative of his enmeshment with his mother and his dependence upon his mother, because they had quite an intense relationship. He, he really was quite a, a mummy's boy. And I think the, the thought that, that he had killed her and taken her out of the equation was something that he was having quite a lot of trouble with. Very near the end of the events at Hungerford that day, he said to the police negotiators, Hungerford must be a bit of a mess by now. I wish I'd stayed in bed. And that, in a way, encapsulates the tragedy of him. Shortly before 7 p.m., police heard a single shot emerge from the school. The standoff ends with Ryan killing himself. The psychotic break is complete. He doesn't do anything dramatic. He simply shoots himself with one of his own rifles. Sergeant Paul Brightwell of the Tactical Firearms Unit began a shouted conversation with him. On many occasions, he seemed to me just to be on the verge of coming out. It wasn't until he said about uh, the fact that he'd got one round of ammunition uh, left. And I sort of said, well, why, why have you kept that one? And he said, it's obvious. In a way, it was a sort of something of relief. Then it was over then, you know, he couldn't shoot anyone else. And uh, in a way, it sort of was brought some closure in my mind. It didn't bring any closure to the events that happened subsequently, but, but it did bring closure to that event. He couldn't shoot any more else and no more lives would be lost. Is somebody who is deliberately targeting men who are upbringing with them. So she was regularly beaten by her grandfather. There were allegations of incest within the family. Her grandfather had a home-built sauna in his house. And if he wanted to punish her for doing something he didn't like, he'd lock her in the sauna and crank up the heat and just let her stay in there. Eileen's abusive childhood sent her on a downward spiral and fueled her hatred of men. This was somebody who was constantly in fear. One of his grandfather allegedly repeatedly said to her that she was worthless, that she should never have been born, that she was a mistake. So she's learning that she can't trust anyone, that she can't depend upon anybody. And this is very, very dangerous. Eileen learned early to use any means available to survive. Before she got to her teen years, uh, she was known as a cigarette bandit. She would trade sexual favors for packs of cigarettes. It's said that from around age 11, she's using her body as something to trade, as a tool. And this kind of disconnection from her emotions is something that, that is going to have a significant impact on the rest of her life. Her behavior left her pregnant, aged 14. Now, on the orders of her grandfather, that baby is adopted. It's taken away from her. And this is just reinforcing those ideas that, that she already has, that those who are supposed to love me hurt me, that I am worthless, that I'm not deserving of love. Shortly after she was forced to give up her child, Eileen was hit by another tragedy. Her grandmother dies of liver failure, having been quite a heavy drinker for many years. Her grandfather actually blames her for her grandmother's death. Her grandfather was furious and threw Warnos out of the house. Aged just 15, Warnos was left homeless. 
Alone, her only option was to live in the woods at the end of their street. She lives a very feral existence, sleeping in an old car, and she's still a child at this point. And, and this is incredibly damaging. There is absolutely nobody there for her. She is literally just taking each day as it comes. She's making sure that she has enough to eat. Um, she is, is basically using her body as she's used it before. She's learning that life is full of rejection, it's full of pain, it's full of fear, and that she really needs to hurt others before they get the chance to hurt her. One person she was still close to was her brother, Keith. Just 11 months older than Eileen, the rumor was that their relationship was an unnatural one. There were allegations of incest. Um, school friends of Keith said that they'd witnessed these things going on. So she felt a connection, but it was a very pathological and a very toxic one. Unable to cope living outside during the cold winter months in Michigan, age 16, Eileen hitchhiked over a thousand miles west to the warmer climes of Colorado. Two years later, she was arrested for her first offense, driving under the influence and disorderly conduct, which included the dangerous discharge of a 22 caliber weapon. Eventually, in 1976, age 20... Needed a beer, she'd sit on a pool table and kind of demand her, get her another beer or whatever. Having blown her inheritance, Warnos took it upon herself to raise the money the two needed to live. Aileen would go out and prostitute to make money so that she could buy things for Tyria. She would want to take care of her and make sure she was happy and, and never want to leave her. And I think that was what it boiled down to. Daytona Beach, Florida, November the 30th, 1989. 33-year-old Eileen Warnos was now living with lover Tyria Moore and was indulging in a host of petty crimes to maintain their extravagant lifestyle. The frequency of the crimes and the force Warnos used to enact them was increasing. It all came to a head the night she was picked up by 51-year-old Richard Mallory. Richard Mallory owned an electrical repair shop and he'd been divorced for, for many years and he didn't make any secret of the fact that he did enjoy engaging in the services of sex workers. He picked her up hitchhiking, they were drinking, they were hanging out as it were and one thing led to another, uh, some type of violent encounter where she ended up killing him. She shot him four times with a nine shot revolver. She took a couple of pieces of property that belonged to him, a camera and a radar detector, and she pawned them. She made some money off of the deal. When Richard Mallory's body was found two weeks after he was killed, there was no evidence to clarify what sparked her rage. When his body was found, it was, it was very decomposed. Basically, all we have to work with is what we have found at the crime scene, the physical evidence and the trace evidence, etc. We do know that he was shot multiple times and his victim was found in a secluded area right outside the city of Daytona. What triggered Warnos to kill for the first time remains a mystery. But what is certain is that the murder of Richard Mallory was the beginning of a dark and deadly chapter. For her entire life, Wernos has been victimized by men. She's been abused by them. But now she's turned the tables. She's the one that's in control and she's very much enjoying it because she's learned from a very early age that violence equals power. And she really is on quite a high at this point. Taking one life once wasn't enough. Six months later, Warnos struck again. There's usually a, what they call a brief cooling off period. And this absolutely applied here. A large part of it was due to her paranoia and her fear of, of getting caught. And, and when she came back from that brief cooling off period, now she was the predator. She was looking for who she was going to kill next. She's somebody who's being proactive. She's seeking out victims, she's getting access to them, she has an opportunity to harm them, and she takes that opportunity. These men, they were all white males. They were all traveling the roads alone. They were middle-aged, 40 to 65. On May the 19th, 1990, she was picked up on the I-75 highway by a 43-year-old machine operator, David Spears. When they pulled over and he began to undress, 
She slipped out of the passenger side door, walked around to the driver's side, aimed and fired. He'd been shot six times. One shot was not enough for Warnos. She was making a point with her killings. She was saying, this is for all the men who have abused me over the years. This was somebody who enjoyed watching men die because for the first time in her life, she was powerful. She was the one in control. She was the one calling the shots. Yeah, I'd love to go out, but I said, you stink. You ain't had a bath. And I don't know when, and I said, I stink. And I said, I ain't doing that. I'll, I'll go get a motel room and we'll clean up, but I ain't going out with no stinking ass woman. Mike told Warnos to wait for him at the bar while he went to get his room key. Instead, he met with a task force outside. And I meet with my outside people and tell them, you know, we make a plan because we knew what she had in mind. The exact words I told them was, piss on the fire and call in the dogs. This hunt's over with. This is her. And I'm not going off with her because I'm not going to be the next victim. Mike returned to the bar with a motel key and showed it to Wuornos. He then waited for her to make the next move. Could I get worried about it? No, she wasn't going to kill me in the bar. I wasn't, you know, I really wasn't worried about it, not at that point. I just went and got another beer and said, just whenever you get ready, I'm ready to go, let's go. A little while later, Warnas and the undercover cop walked out of the bar. The owner of the last resort, Al Bulling, was an eyewitness to what happened next. They were just sitting at the bar drinking, you know. They didn't want to arrest her in the bar or anything because they didn't know what she had or well, didn't want nobody else getting hurt. So they waited for her to walk out the door. As soon as they hit the door, that's when they arrested her. Wernus was bundled into a car and taken away. The task force had successfully executed the arrest safely. I wasn't worried about my safety because I had the best backup in the world. It was a relief. I think that's the best way to describe it as a relief. The next day, investigators managed to track down Wernos's partner, Tyria Moore, in Scranton, Pennsylvania. And they said to her, let's make a, a deal. If you can provide evidence, if you can help us convict Eileen Wernos, then we will give you immunity from prosecution. So I think this, this was a very, very tempting offer. Tyria agreed to call Eileen and let the police record their conversations. Lee. They're coming after me. I know they are. No, they're not. What? I have to confess myself. Okay. Yes. Why the hell did you do this? Why did you do this? The same month she was arrested, Eileen Warnos fully confessed to the seven murders. Well, I came here to confess. I'm honored to be straight up with one thing right there and now. Sure. The reason I'm confessing is there's not another girl. There is not another girl. Okay. And there's not another girl. Okay, so then what you're telling us is you're voluntarily coming forward to talk to us now. Yeah, to let you know that I'm the one that did the job. Despite the seriousness of her... To all the world and to all his schoolmates and friends, he was simply Mark. Nice enough lad, nice enough young man. But one incident in his teens was an early warning sign that evil was brewing inside 16-year-old Hobson. 
He left Selby High School and got a job uh, in a butcher's shop in Galthorpe. He was quite shy and seemed quite quiet. But after about three weeks, he lost his temper uh, with a colleague at the shop and uh, threatened to stab him with a boning knife. And the colleague was, was terrified, so he was sacked. At the time, Hobson's violent outburst seemed like an isolated incident. Five years later, age 21, he moved in with his childhood sweetheart. Mark Hobson is in his early 20s, and they form a family together. So he has two stepchildren, and he has a daughter of his own. And they appear to be a normal family unit. In 1994, two years after the birth of their daughter, the couple married. It should have been a happy and fulfilling time for him. She was later to refer to Mark as almost a perfect husband. Did everything right, worked hard. He was at that point working in the Drax power station as well as doing some landscape gardening. There was nothing to indicate at all that Mark Hobson would turn into a killer. In fact, rather the opposite. He seemed an upright family man, one child of his own, two stepchildren. Out of the blue, three and a half years after they were married, Hobson ended the relationship. Mark Hobson literally walks out, says, I can't do this anymore, I'm leaving, and, and literally just ups and goes. Now, there is a brief reconciliation, but, but this doesn't last for very long because Hobson has changed quite a lot. He started to drink quite heavily, and she doesn't want him around the children. So, literally, overnight, things have changed. Hobson's divorce sparked a swift downward spiral. Hobson's life did start unravelling. He hasn't got that structure anymore. I think that that structure and that routine was something that was quite important to him. He really is off the rails. He left the power station and went to work as a nightclub bouncer, doorman, in Selby in Yorkshire. And in my mind, it was the move to becoming a nightclub bouncer that was to send Hobson completely off the rails. For the first time in his life, he came into contact with industrial quantities of drugs, be it ecstasy, cannabis, cocaine, and he also started for the first time in his life to drink, and not just to drink a little, but to drink. Hobson's drug and alcohol addictions changed him. He was uh, developing a rather Jekyll and Hyde personality. Um, he could be laughing and joking one moment, and the next minute he could be flying into a terrible temper, a, real, a really bad rage. Alcohol reduces inhibitions. What does that mean? It's the most dangerous drug in the world to be taken by somebody who has a murderous impulse waiting to bubble up because alcohol reaches into the frontal cortex, removes the self-control, and so while alcoholism doesn't make somebody murderous, it can en enable the murderous part of a person's soul to emerge. It was an utterly ruthless killing, no doubt fueled by considerable quantities of alcohol. After the brutal killing, Hobson used supplies he'd previously bought to conceal her body. He dragged Claire up the stairs and wrapped her body in bin bags. So it's very much a case of out of sight, out of mind. He used some bleach to clean up one of the areas in the flat because I think he might have been bothered by there being some kind of stain, some kind of smell there. But he stays in the flat with her body. Her body is decomposing. This is the summer months. This is going to be most unpleasant. But, but he simply doesn't care about that. The following week, Claire's decomposing body remained in the flat while Hobson moved on with the second phase of his plan, Diane. Diane was Claire's twin sister, and Hobson had developed a bit of a fixation with her. He'd actually said to a work colleague, I'm going to have her. Now, that phrase is very revealing for me. That shows for me that Hobson is somebody who looks at women as things to be owned, things to be possessed, not human beings with, with rights and feelings. He's quite misogynistic, and he's, he's got himself set on this idea that he's going to have Diane. Hobson contacted Diane and concocted a story to get her to his flat. The attack on Claire almost pales into insignificance behind the attack on her twin sister, Diane. 
A week after he has dispatched Claire and leaving her to decompose in the bedroom of their flat, he telephones Diane at her home and says that uh, her sister, a twin, Claire, would very much like to see her and she's been ill with glandular fever. It was, of course, a pretense, no more than a bait to get the object of his attentions into his hands. Diane told her parents she was going to visit Claire and then planned to meet her boyfriend in the pub. She was last seen leaving her home that evening and made the journey to her sister's. What she couldn't have predicted is that she fell into the hands of the man who'd already murdered her twin sister. Now, there's no doubt whatever that the objective here was an entirely sexual one. There'd been no sexual attack on Claire, but there was a very distinct sexual motive in Diane's killing. And the details of it almost defy description. Once she set foot in the flat, her fate was sealed. Hobson forced his will on Diane in the most terrifying way. She was tortured, she was cut with razors, with scissors. Those sort of injuries are sometimes the most upsetting because you can imagine what they'd feel like. A fatal stab wound to the heart. Most people can't imagine how that would feel to be cut on the arm with a razor. You can empathize with what that would feel like. She must have been absolutely terrified, you know, really fearful of what was going on and, and doing everything she possibly could to try and save her own life. But, but he wanted to own her, he wanted to possess her. He had her in that flat and he was going to do whatever he wanted with her. But Hobson wasn't satisfied with just fulfilling his sadistic sexual desires. So while Claire was murdered, Diane is tortured and assaulted and murdered. It seems almost like she's more the focus of what he wants to do. Claire just needed to be taken out of the picture. I think that the attack on Diane was so much more aggressive because this was Hobson's target. This was what he wanted. He probably fantasized, he probably ruminated over this for quite a considerable period of time. Claire was simply the obstacle to get out of the way and I think he saw Diane as the prize. Eventually, Hobson beat Diane with the same hammer that he used to murder her sister, Claire. He then strangled and suffocated her. The thing about these sorts of assaults is that they are physically difficult to do. It is not a quick, sudden spur of the moment thing. It takes effort. Even if someone were simply angry, there's time there to realize what you're doing and to stop. He actually had a list of people that he was intending to kill. He had a list of items that he would need to actually carry out those murders. The police found at his home address a list with the name of other people uh, who appeared to be potential victims. The parents of Diane and Claire, and indeed the parents of his ex-wife. This was somebody who was not snapping, who was not out of control. This was very well thought through. After seven days on the run, Hobson eventually came out of hiding in the village of Shipton by Benningborough, approximately six miles from York. One week after, the bodies of Claire and Diana discovered, the bodies of Jim and Joan Britton are discovered, one week later, that he is finally spotted in a garage not far away from York. 34-year-old Hobson didn't realize, but he'd been recognized. Hobson was finally tracked down when he went into a petrol station to buy a few items, and the attendant in there recognized him from a photo that had been made public in a police appeal. So within 20 minutes, huge number of police officers descended on the scene, armed police officers, um, knowing that he was somewhere in the vicinity, um, and, uh, and the manhunt really intensified, uh, and he was found not long afterwards. On the 25th of July 2004, in Shipton by Benningborough, Mark Hobson, Britain's most wanted man, was arrested. His hideout was discovered just eight feet from the main road in the area, the A19. Hobson was found burrowed in a gap between a thorn bush and a septic tank behind an upholstery shop. 
and he was clearly in a disheveled state. He was, looked very tired. He was quite recognisably the person that had been on the, the wanted posters that had been around for the previous week. Once caught, Hobson showed no remorse for what he'd done. When Hobson was arrested, he tells the officers, well, I'm a fucking murderer, aren't I? And I think this is, this is really, really interesting because he, he knows exactly what he's done. This isn't somebody who is denying responsibility. He's, he's fessing up straight away. Finally in custody, Hobson's reign of terror was over. On the 2nd of June, 2010, a lone gunman embarked on a deadly killing spree that rocked the nation. Shooting many of his victims at close range, 52-year-old taxi driver Derek Bird even murdered his own brother. Bird's shooting spree effectively occupied only about 12 hours. And the impact was extraordinary because this was in the days, of course, of rolling news, of 24-hour news channels. As it unfolded and as Bird became more and more obsessed by killing anybody who came across, so it became ever more dramatic. Most of Bird's victims were completely random targets. People delivering catalogues, people taking their shopping home, people just going about their day-to-day -day business. And I think it emphasises for me how fragile life is, especially when you encounter somebody like Derek Bird, who has nothing to lose. Derek Bird killed 12 people, injured a further 11, and then turned the gun on himself. After his death, his family released a statement to the press via the local vicar. He was a loving dad and recently became a grandfather. We would like to say that we do not know why our dad committed these horrific crimes. We are both mortified by the sad events. This killer's story begins in 1957. Derek and his twin brother were born on the 27th of November in Ennerdale Bridge, a village a few miles out of Whitehaven to a seemingly ordinary family. The twins had an older brother and their father worked nearby for the local council. The twins went to a school in Whitehaven. Despite being older by only five minutes, Derek seemed to be in the shadow of his younger twin brother, David. It's always assumed, isn't it, that twins will adore each other. You know, there are many twins that are like that, but in this particular case, I don't think they were. I think they were rather isolated from one another. David was probably the more likeable one, Derek the quieter one. He was kind of a bit of a loner. As the brothers grew up, the differences between them became more apparent. David was his twin brother, but that was where any resemblance ended, I think. Um, David was better at sports. He was on the rugby team at school. Derek wasn't a particularly athletic child. David was cleverer, he was more handsome, he was more successful, and many people have described Derek as living in David's shadow. And this isn't anything unusual. Many siblings are outshone by, by others in their family, but they, they don't carry the, the kind of rage and the kind of resentment that Derek Bird did, I think, because that was what his personality was. He really did catastrophize this relationship with his brother, and he blamed him for so many things. Despite their differences, the twins shared their father's passion for hunting game. And just before his 17th birthday, Derek was granted a shotgun license. His father was involved in guns. In small towns in the countryside of England, owning weapons, is, especially a shotgun uh, for hunting, um, is not unusual. Bird's passion for guns continued into adulthood. Bird loved shooting. It was very much a solitary pursuit. He had very little in common with his fellow taxi drivers in Whitehaven. In February 2008, his taxi was vandalized and he suspected one of them. There is often quite a bit of banter between taxi drivers, and, and sometimes this can turn quite nasty, especially when there are disputes over fares. 
whether somebody has picked up somebody else's passenger, because this is how these guys make their living. But for Derek Bird, he attaches an awful lot of significance to this because he has this permanent exclusion narrative. Everybody is out to get me. Everybody is against me. And I think this does add to that. Money was tight for Bird, and he became increasingly paranoid about it. When Derek Bird's father had died, there was an argument about the will and who was to get what in the will. Bird felt that his twin brother and the family solicitor were planning to reveal to the tax authorities who were examining Bird's affairs at that time that he had a secret bank account in which there was £60,000. He was convinced that the world, his brother, his solicitor, and every other taxi driver was against him. And then added on top of that a little fuel that everyone was against him. Bird also discovered that his father had lent his twin brother David money before he died. Derek found out that his father made uh, an unspoken secret loan to David. Even at the point where he's the person, you know, taking over and being responsible for the welfare of his mother, David is getting the money, feeling disinherited and, and believing, as he did, that his his brother and his, and his accountants were plotting against him to get him jailed for tax fraud were just too much for him. He was of the view that his brother and his solicitor had conspired against him. He felt very bitter about a £25,000 loan that his father had made to his twin brother back in 1998. So this is somebody who really does hang on to grudges. He collects them, he stores them away. He doesn't deal with those, those issues, with that anger. And it all boils and boils and boils away. He was a man who was rapidly going nowhere, was finding himself uh, alone. The frustration was simply too much for him. Alienated from everyone and increasingly annoyed that his twin brother may have benefited from his father's death, Derek Bird had finally had enough and came to a fateful decision. Full of rage and armed with his rifle, in the early hours of June the 2nd, he drove to his brother's house in Lamplu. Derek Bird arrives in his brother David's house with his silenced 22 caliber rifle and confronts him sometime in the early hours. I can only imagine the brother would have been utterly bewildered. Suddenly his brother appears in the middle of the night, wakes him up. Bird proceeds without any warning to shoot his brother. Not once or twice, but 11 times in the head and the body. This was a really, really cowardly act. He's caught his brother at the time when he's most vulnerable. It wasn't just an intention to kill, it was an intention to completely destroy. The shooting somebody 11 times, that's way more violence than you need to get the job done. So I think this does show the intensity of the resentment that Bird felt towards his brother. For him, it was a cathartic release. Remember, this isn't just a brother from his point of view that cheated him out of some inheritance, you know, late in life. This is a brother who was the person to whom he was compared for his whole life and compared unfavorably. So this was the final act of justice from his point of view. Having shot his twin brother dead, Derek Bird then left David's house and made his way to the home of 60-year-old Kevin Commons. Just after five o'clock that morning, Derek Bird drives to the house of his solicitor, Kevin Commons, and he hangs around waiting for him for around about four hours. So for me, this is really significant because it's showing that, that Bird has a rage that is not dissipating. I think when most people are angry and they don't have an outlet for that anger, it does fizzle away and people calm down, people feel better, but not Derek Bird. Several dog walkers saw Bird outside Kevin Common's farmhouse in the village of Frizzington. He waited there for several hours, planning his next deadly move. Around about 10 o'clock that morning, Kevin Commons drives up his driveway, sees Derek Bird blocking him in and probably wonders what on earth is going on. 
He's not given long to process that thinking until Bird comes out and shoots him twice. He must be absolutely shocked. You know, what on earth is he doing? Um, so, so he's just basically trying to survive at this point in time. He, he hasn't killed him. So he, he stumbles to his feet. He starts to, to crawl away to go back towards his house. A neighbor heard the gunshots and saw Kevin Commons trying to flee. Bird follows him, but replaces the shotgun with the rifle and proceeds to shoot him twice more killing him at the spot. Just after 10 a.m., the concerned neighbors called the police who discovered Kevin's body in his driveway. But Bird was nowhere to be seen. He'd fled the scene in his car, armed with two weapons, a 12-gauge sawed-off shotgun and a 22 caliber rifle. Shotguns and rifles are very different weapons. A rifle is designed to send a stable projectile a long distance. A shotgun is designed to spread pellets out. A rifle certainly can fire a small projectile that can kill you, but at short range, the mass of pellets can produce utterly devastating injuries. With greater range, less effective, but close up, a shotgun is far more deadly. Derek Bird had killed two innocent men, his twin brother David and 60-year-old family solicitor Kevin Commons. With no ammunition and his car damaged, he drove to a beauty spot near Boot called Dr. Bridge. He'd run out of shotgun bullets and suddenly he realized that unlike his hyperbolic fantasies before this, Life as he you know it was really over. At approximately 12.30 p.m., police found Bird's car abandoned with one of his guns inside. Bird was now on foot armed with his rifle. With the public still at high risk, the police had now taken the decision to name Derek Bird as their prime suspect, but there was still no sign of him. Then, at approximately 1.30 p.m., police officers found Derek Bird's body in a wooded area near Boot. He'd shot himself. He'd engaged in the ultimate failure act. There was no reason for him to be here anymore. He's got nothing left to lose at this point in time, and spree killers will often take their own lives. And what this represents is a way of taking back control. So they are the ones who are making the final decision on when it is they die. They don't want to go to prison. They don't want to have to face the consequences of their actions. So they take that very calculated decision to kill themselves. This killer's story begins in 1954. Danny Harold Rowling was born in Shreveport, Louisiana, on May the 26th. His 20-year-old mother fell pregnant almost immediately after the couple married, much to his father's disgust. Danny Rowling was the son of a policeman, but he wasn't a very compassionate policeman. In fact, he was a violent and abusive father. For the rest of Danny's life, his father would refer to him as an accident that should never have happened. He had a violent temper, and almost anything young Danny did was able to ignite it. If he didn't breathe properly, he was beaten by his father, that the slightest thing would set him off. And I think if we look at that now, we'd call that coercive control now. We'd call that the kind of behavior that is designed to chip away at somebody's self-esteem that really does destroy someone's identity. Time after time throughout his childhood, Rolling was told by his supremely arrogant father that he was useless. It was a useless piece of work and never would amount to anything. Fifteen months later, Rowling's mother would fall pregnant again and gave birth to her second son. She would continually try to protect the two boys from their father's destructive influence. His mother flees several times, taking him and his younger brother 
they get away from his abusive, domineering father, but she soon goes back to the home. So you've got this constant chewing and froing, this, this constant state of upheaval, and this creates an environment that isn't safe, that isn't secure. To add to Rowling's insecurity, his mother, his only form of stability, was struggling with mental health issues. Despite him needing her, she wasn't always around. Still a young child, Rowling's existence became a solitary one. He would hide in the woods or wander the neighborhood to escape the constant abuse from his father. He would go out at night when his, his parents didn't know about it, and he would look through the windows of the neighbors' homes and he'd see them around the, the kitchen table, around the dinner table, happy families all together. And he's got that building resentment. Why have these people got this when I haven't? What's wrong with me? And that's something that, that continues to, to bubble away in the background. Rowling yearned for a normal family, the kind of home life that everyone else appeared to have. The suffering at the hands of his father, coupled with his mother's mental instability, sent him on a downward spiral. Now, the impact this had on quite a suggestible child was severe. Now, I'm not suggesting for a second that Rolling's father made Rolling into a serial killer, but there was no doubt at all that there was a very great deal of animosity between father and son. As a teenager, Rolling continued to escape his home life. He spent even more time wandering the neighborhood, and around the age of 13, his innocent childhood pastime of watching families became sexually motivated. Rowling had a habit of stalking people, and he would watch them. Um, that voyeurism that had developed during his early years, when he'd looked through the windows of, of the happy families in his neighborhood and had that simmering resentment, turned into something else. It turned into something quite sinister. Rowling took a particular interest in watching young women. He was caught several times and began to get a reputation as a peeping Tom. His life had now started on a destructive path of crime. It was that classic serial killer pattern. Petty crime, small offences, gradually escalating into greater and greater offences. By now, he'd started drinking heavily. In 1971, age 16, a drunk Rowling had a fight with his father and he was locked up for two weeks in a juvenile detention centre. Armed with his K-Bar combat knife, once he arrived in Gainesville, Rowling set up a makeshift camp in the woods. He was a, a vagrant, a bum, if you like, but he had a purpose and his purpose was a very particular kind of victim. Danny primarily targeted uh, young women, and they were always young brunettes like his former wife had been. I was always struck by the fact that, uh, for the most part, his victims were of a type. On the 23rd of August, 1990, new roommates Christina Powell and Sonia Larson were preparing for the beginning of the fall semester at the University of Florida. They're 17 and 18 years old. They're freshmen. This is the, the start of an exciting period in their lives. Someone else was enjoying their excitement too. That evening, they caught the attention of Danny Rowling. And he's watching them through the window. He can see them giggling along together, having a nice time, washing the dishes. You can just imagine the kind of conversations they're having about the things they're excited about at university. Rowling has been watching them. In fact, he's probably spent the best part of the night outside in the woods just behind the apartment block. In the early hours, he breaks in. He used very specific equipment, a screwdriver to get in through a sliding door that most of these girls had, and a K-bar knife, which he also used. Those two elements were his signature. Rowling found Christina asleep on the couch downstairs and Sonia in bed upstairs. So he's decided that Christina is the one that he wants. So he gets Sonia out of the way first. He leaves Christina Powell asleep on the couch and creeps upstairs and attacks Sonia Larson while she's asleep. He puts duct tape over her mouth to prevent her screaming and also, of course, to prevent her waking up Christina, who's asleep downstairs. 
Rowling stabbed Sonia repeatedly until she was dead. He then made his way back downstairs to Christina, who was still asleep on the couch. He wakes up, puts duct tape over her mouth to prevent her screaming, tapes her hands behind her back, and proceeds to cut off her clothes and underclothes and rape her with a knife to her throat. He then turns her onto her face and stabs her five times in the back. It's an act of the most grotesque wickedness. As with his first female victim, Julie, in Shreveport, Rowling washed and posed his victims. The gun used in the bank robbery had been sold to an individual who had a missing finger, and one of the Florida Department of Law Enforcement agents stood up and says, holy shit, and the whole room falls silent. And he proceeds to explain that during the crime scene investigation of the first murders of Christina Powell and Sonia Larson, that they found a piece of paper towel on the counter in the kitchen. On one side was the imprint of a man's penis, as if he were wiping himself off after conducting a sex act. On the other side of the paper was a handprint with a finger missing. And it was at that point that everybody realized the bank robber is the murderer. The problem is, we still didn't know who that was. Once that connection had been made, the crime lab began re-examining other exhibits from the Woodland campsite in connection with the student murders. Among the elements of significance were a ski mask whose fibers matched the duct tape found at the third murder. Krista Hoyt's pubic hairs were found on Ronning's sleeping bag at the campsite. Blood on a pair of his trousers was found to be Manita Boda's. A screwdriver was found which matched the marks on the sliding doors by which he got into the apartments. But the most significant, perhaps, of all was there was a series of audio tapes. In these disturbing recordings, Rowling alluded to the horror that he was about to unleash. I know I have to run the rest of my life, but I'm getting pretty good at it. I'm a big boy. I take care of myself. We're all down here for just a breath anyway. Well, I'm going to sign off for a little bit. That's something I gotta do. As more details of the Gainesville killings emerged, police in Shreveport, Louisiana, realized that there were significant similarities between these cases and the unsolved murders of the Grissom family in 1989. They suspected all eight homicides may be connected, but the identity of this serial killer remained a mystery. After a period of time when it became evident that the murderer had either left Florida or had been arrested because no further murders had been committed that matched that MO, a decision was made to test the DNA of all inmates in Florida who had been arrested between, I think it was like a three or a four month window. Anybody who had been arrested during that time frame was gonna have their DNA checked against the DNA on the, on the homicides. Danny Rowling was in jail pending the trial for the armed robbery of the grocery store in nearby Ocala so he was on the list to have his DNA checked against the killers. He also had a partially missing finger on his left hand. They obtain his profile, and lo and behold, they match and they've got their man. On the 24th of January, 1991, as a result of DNA testing, Rowling became the prime suspect in the Gainesville student murders. Brian Jarvis was a sergeant covering major crimes in Marion County, where Rowling was brought in for questioning in connection with the murders. When Danny walked into the interview room, he was shackled. He had a lot of anxiety. His left leg would tap, it would shuffle. Um, he would be scratching his leg or picking lint off of it. In fact, there was one or two points there where the detective offered to show him the photos of the crime scene. He said, I want to make sure you know what we're talking about here. And Danny couldn't look at him. He turned his head away and he reacted. He said, I don't want to see that. 
On September the 18th, 1991, Danny Rowling was convicted for three counts of attempted armed robbery and two counts of aggravated assault on a law enforcement officer. He was jailed for life. Finally, two months later, Rowling was indicted on five counts of first-degree murder for the atrocities in Gainesville. <laughs>